Squeaky doors, clogged sinks, finicky engines. When things break around the house, you take care of it. However, when something's off in the bedroom, you try just to not think about it. Come on, man. What are you waiting for? Take care of it. Go to GetRoman.com slash Piven right now. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. Getting started is simple. Just go to GetRoman.com slash Piven and complete an online visit. It's easy, man. Don't be ashamed. Just take care of it. Solve the problem. Go to GetRoman.com slash Piven now. You'll get $15 off your first month. If medication is appropriate, it ships to you free with two-day shipping. It's simple. It's easy. You don't have to be ashamed. Just solve the problem. And then literally everybody wins. She'll thank you. I'm thanking you. You'll thank me. We'll all thank each other. Let's just be thankful. Get hard. Get hard, you little freak. Go to GetRoman.com slash Piven now. Also, something really fun for all of us. Um, your feedback has been incredible. I, I just want to hear from you guys. Listen, if you go to SpeakPipe.com slash JPiven, SpeakPipe.com slash JPiven, just ask me anything you want. I'll put it on the air. Um, you know, I can do it as myself. I can do it as Ari Gold. Um, comments, questions. Uh, you want me to berate you? I don't know. Maybe we could even call it rolling with Piven. Call it rolling with our rolling calls with Ari. I don't know. There's so many different ways. You got gold. I don't know. Let's just let's workshop some titles. I want to interact with you guys. It almost will be like you're my co-host for the podcast. So what are your thoughts, ideas, comments, anything? I want to mix it up with you guys. I can't wait to get into it. This has been an incredible ride. It's only going to get better. Speakpipe.com slash jpiven. This guy says we're pivot. You understand just how we live it. This for me is like rap religion. Hope I'm on beat because we got this guy. When it comes to this, y'all, I can get it hype. When it comes to this, y'all, calm has risen. How you living, huh? Yo, how you living, pivot? I cannot tell you guys how excited I am about this episode. All roads lead to the Doug Ellen episode, the creator of Entourage. People come up to me all the time and they go, my God, man, you were improvising. That was a documentary. I'm like, no, it was all written, every word of it, uh, by the brilliant Doug Ellen, who is the creator of Entourage, and we're going to sit down with him. And so uh, we take the gloves off. Uh, things that I never even expected to talk about or hear. Uh, it was very healing and amazing, and I want to keep the conversation going. Here it is, the great Doug Allen. We're sitting here with with the great Doug Allen, who is the creator of Entourage. And if you ever want to know, like, who wrote all of that, what's what's funny is our job as actors is to make it all like improvisational and they think it was like a documentary and they don't realize that you wrote the whole thing, which yeah. is a blessing and a curse. Yeah. I mean, you know, to me, it's not a blessing and a curse. I mean, I, especially, you know, when we're talking about Ari, there's so much of me and Ari, but I could have never performed it. So, um, and weirdly enough, for whatever reason, um, I wanted you to do this before I even knew what the character was. And it's very strange because uh, even other shows that I've been doing after, I've never had someone specific in mind, but you're in the first outline of this show Bible to go to HBO and it says Jeremy Piven playing Jeff Jacobs. Like that's what it says. And that is from what I know of you of on Sanders and whatever else. And there's not even Ari yet. I know, but what's what's so amazing to me about that is, you're talking about Larry Sanders. I, I'm playing the head writer on the great Gary Shandling show, um, where I'm playing a very um, insecure head writer who doesn't believe he's funny, and they end up firing him and all this stuff. And then you saw me, you know, playing. I did 116 best friend roles, playing yep. Cusack's best friend roles, um, and so you saw something in me that wasn't even Ari, but you somehow knew that. I, can't, I honestly can't even explain it. That's crazy. You obviously got in incredible physical shape after Sanders. Not that you were in bad shape, but you know. And there was no Ari, though. I didn't know who Ari Emanuel was until we pitched the show to HBO. And in that document, 
I'm thinking you're Jeff Jacobs, who really you have nothing in common with Jeff. You know Jeff, who's a great guy. You don't really have anything in common with him. But what I saw on Sanders and your other stuff, which I always say this a lot about, a lot of what the show is when people go, oh, Ari, Jeremy stole the show or whatever. Your energy kind of feeds throughout the entire show, even when you're not on camera. And I think it's not that you and I are similar off camera necessarily, but it's just energy that you can't, you can't create. It's like something that you, you kind of have and it's like music. And I think, uh, you know, you're a drummer and, um, well, I, I want to stop you really quickly there. First of all, this is like, uh, it's so funny because we didn't really talk too much when we were filming and and and, you know it's funny because you guys were interviewing on the victory podcast recently malcolm and he said well piven's not a very good hang is he (laughs) and you know everyone's laughing and you know i'm not very fun and no one likes me and it's but i think he's it's interesting life but i'm sorry you think what i think he's playing like i think like it's a bit no you did the podcast with him correct how did that go i mean i think malcolm is it's a bit for some reason he's got this thing with you that you i guess you don't see it that way but i would love to hear it you know oh i have nothing with him (laughs) you know what i mean i mean as you know more than anyone i was honored you would come to me and say hey man we want to try to get this older actor do you mind coming in and i would just be like bro just tell him you love him we're like can you do that you know what i mean and so i was honored i'd come in and no matter what icon it was I would, you know, talk to them and and we would get them to do the show. I'm just a huge fan of his. Clockwork Orange is one of my favorite movies in the world. Then when the guy is shitting all over me and doing these horrible things to, as he said, get get my performance up, you know what I mean? And he said, well, you should thank me. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, as you know more than anyone, don't need that. We're good. We're locked and loaded. do horrible things? Like what, like... I, you know, I can't get into everything, but there's cer- there's certain things that you don't do. There's certain things that you there's there is a a code of ethics, you know, amongst men or whatever. You don't, uh, you know, you don't go there. Right. And he knows, and he's a he's a very, as they say, cheeky dude. And you, you look, you know, I listened to that podcast. I mean, I love the Victory Podcast. I did it a bunch of times, and I'm a fan of it. And I was listening to it, and you know. He was not joking around when you said, well, what's going on with you and Piven? Like, you just did a movie together. You must be okay. He goes, well, I didn't know he was in the movie. And like, yes, you knew you. I was in the movie. And then, okay. and then he said, and then he said, does he even still do movies? <laughs> and, then, and then he said, he's not a very good hang, is he? Now, here's the deal. Um, we were face to face after we finished filming. And, you know, we I, I made it very clear to him. And that's one of the great things about podcasts is you can sit down with people face to face in a long form and be very honest. I wish I would have dropped the gloves even more because I said to him, listen, I think I misunderstood you. And maybe it's a cultural thing. You your country is about taking the piss. You know what I mean? You're always busting someone's balls and we're maybe a little more earnest. And so I took you too seriously. And. You know, so that's kind of what his shtick is, if but you will. But that's how I look at it. I and and me as Entourage was was busting balls. I looked at it, and even like Conley and I talked about it after the podcast. I'm like, he's he's joking, right? This is like a a bit, and that's how I saw it. Even from the minute like we went to I forget lunch or dinner, me, you, Kevin, Malcolm, and he started in instantaneously, but. Me being a fan of British humor, John Cleese and and things like that. I just thought it was a kind of a thing. I don't know. But I didn't realize it bothered you at all because you guys worked so well together that. I just think there has to be something else beside just busting balls. Sure. Because sometimes I feel like that it can be used when someone doesn't necessarily have a great sense of humor. If they're just a. What's the word? Cunt? You know, I think that's the word. You know what I mean? And then they say, well, I'm just busting your balls, mate. You know, it's like, well, hold on a second. Let there be something else. Do you know what I mean? And I think that was part of the problem, I think, with us as as a group, with me. You know, I don't know if the variables being from Chicago or whatever were maybe too. uh, I grew up in this like theater community Mm -hmm. and, you know, we all write each other notes. and And so, like, I didn't get right away. It was like, oh, wait. You're just fucking with me. You know what I mean? So 
It was, I think there was some, maybe some miscommunication of you and Malcolm. You're talking to all of us. I think, I think 1000% me and Malcolm. Right. My point is I'm not thinking, oh, this guy's having fun with me and busting my balls. The way I, to be honest with you, it's interesting. We, I've gotten to know you. I really mean this more in the last year yeah. than in our previous 15 years. And to be honest with you, I used to think you showing up was a fucking breeze for you. I really did. I believed that you were like, I got this. So, and when you've told me now about uh, that is memory, you don't have a great memory and it was real work for you. That's how good you were. Like, that's how I, I look at it because for me, and I say this, I don't want to mention any other actors, but there's so, I know when I write something, what I want it to sound like. And there are certain actors, you, Dylan, others too, that always made it better. Like when the words came out, I was like, fuck, that's better than what I wrote. That's better than what I saw. And I always thought it was a fucking cakewalk for you. Like I really did. Like I, I never realized how much you were putting into it. And I think that's part of. See, that's that's shocking to yeah, me. That's well, shocking. But that's part of how That's shocking you are. to me. Well, but hold on a second. Yeah. You wrote these brilliant four page rants, right? And I would have to be letter perfect because they were amazing. Yeah. So my point is, and we're, we're working at the speed of light. I don't have a photographic memory. I'm human, yeah. unfortunately. I wish I did. Yeah. So my point was like, I had to like stay locked and loaded in order to pull this off. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because my fear is I just don't want the work to suffer. Yeah. So as Malcolm said, I wasn't a very good hang. Well, in the, hold on a second. In the words of Denzel Washington, you know, and I'm going to probably butcher it. It's like, you know, would you rather be everyone's friend on the set and the crew and the one that's making everyone laugh and have this kind of performance that you're maybe not yeah, so proud of yeah. or just kind of be locked into your zone and not be as approachable. I right. remember like, you know, I would do these scenes where I'm like literally breaking computers, ripping scripts with my teeth, you know, and losing yeah. my mind. And then you would come in and you would have this look on your face like you were approaching a caged animal. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you even realized it. Yeah. And you were like, you know, calm down. And I'm just like, you have to understand, like, I through every fiber of my being into that yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. so like for me to even like get my heart to a resting state again right. is not easy yeah and i think i think that's part of you know i don't come from theater i didn't like i wasn't on a lot of sets i made a couple of independent movies that sold and usually like when people ask me why don't you like why don't you write um i don't know something like like aquaman or some shit like that i'm like i just i only think about kind of what I know and what I see. And so I know for you, it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's so weird for me to think about it because I thrive in chaos. And you know, I'd have 40 people on the set who were watching. We'd have a charity yeah. guy over here. Uh, and it was I, my nightmare. And, and I think- It was my nightmare. And I think the, Bro, I never came anywhere near you guys. I didn't yeah. sit over there behind the monitor once in my life because I'm like, I can't, there's so many distractions over there. And I do, I'd like a free I, trip to Aruba, I, I but I need I, to memorize my fucking lines. <laughs> I appreciate it now in such a different way because especially with the four guys, obviously they had much shorter lines usually. And this anything guy. in there for me, bro? <laughs> and cut. Great work, everybody. <laughs> Jeremy, here's the fucking, here's your Torah but, portion to memorize but, again. <laughs> but at the same time, I think, I hope as an actor, you're like, fuck. Because here, let me, I just want to go back because... What happened was when we get you to, to do the show, which again, I don't really know you're going to be great at this particular role or our shit is going to mesh, but we did the Koi scene and the pilot. And I am, I'm a, I'm a sick perfectionist who also, I see something in my head and when it's not the way I want it, I'm like, fuck. So there were a lot of times where we were shooting the pilot where I was like, this is not how I saw it. And then we get to that Koi scene. And you and Connolly were sitting there and do this scene. And I just remember where, which to me is the magical thing that can happen on a set. I've spent a year and a half working on this script. I know the words like the back of my hand, but at the same time, I know I'm on a set and I know I'm watching something fake. You guys sat down at that table at Koi and I was like, 
I'm riveted. I'm all of a sudden not, I, I wasn't the director per se, but you know, I was, but yeah. I, I, I would, all of a sudden I'm watching a scene and I'm like, holy shit. And I remember, even though we, I don't talk to Lev now, I looked at him. I'm like, dude, he's going to win a fucking Emmy for this show. I know it. And he, I don't remember what his reaction was. I have no <laughs> idea. No, I mean, I think, look, we all know how good you were. And in that moment at that scene, I, I'm telling you, I was like, I fucking got really fucking lucky because for some reason, again, I can't say what it was. Obviously, I loved you. Everybody thinks you're hilarious and all the shit you've done before Entourage. But 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 not really, by the way, as you know, you, you can do. I was 40 movies into it before we started Entourage and I'm still a journeyman actor. Yeah. And that's the reality. And you saw something. Thank God. And by the way, even Sean Penn said to me, he goes, you should write Doug Allen a Christmas card every year. And I'm like, I'm Jewish, you fucking degenerate. <laughs> Shut up. But you know now, what? I don't think so. It, I, it is. It is the writing and, and it. And so it's my job. And it's so interesting. You say you don't. You didn't know that I had to put all this work into it. It's like I could every time we would do like, you know, some sort of a junket or we're, we're talking and and this is where you weren't involved. And now you are involved. And I see you having a time of your life because you're front and center. <laughs> yeah. And you've been one. You've written the entourage and now you are the entourage. And I can tell you're loving every second. of I, it. I, I don't want to say like, you are. But no, but I don't want to say it like that. But the thing is that if we if we want to go on this tangent. Yeah. What I found is writing for me. And again, you love acting, but writing for me was torture. Like it really, it was not an enjoyable process. And But the results were incredible. When I got to see, and again, I mean this sincerely, when people like you, Dylan and others, Jeffrey, T and I don't, I don't mean to dismiss our guys because I love all of them. We, we couldn't have cast better. But when your words get better than you could have done, and listen, I'm not going to lie. I put myself on tape for myself, for Ari, and I was like, God, I write this. I know what it sounds like, but I cannot do it. It's impossible. See, but you're smart enough to know because you're you're a fan of great athletes. You know, um, you know that there is a variable to it, and you know it's part of the ten thousand hours yeah. Malcolm Gladwell yeah. ideology. Where, and again. We would be doing Q and A's and then I would, someone asked me like, what's your process? And I would start talking about it. And every, all the guys' eyes would be like, oh my God, this dude is going to talk about acting again. And I know I'm a boring fucking theater nerd. People think that I'm, you know, Ari yeah. Gold and they want me to represent them. Yeah. And, and the reality is if I hadn't crawled up on stage at eight years old, and if I hadn't worked my entire life, and if the great Tim Robbins hadn't taught me Commedia dell'arte, which and this is the part where everyone turns off the <laughs> podcast, by the way, but Commedia dell'arte is the first form of acting where everything is heightened and over the top. Everything Ari did was heightened and over the top. You play these emotional states and you play them real, but I'm fucking chewing the scenery up, but it has to be real. Now, not to talk shit, but you know, at 37 years old, I won the Fresh Face of the Year Award because of Entourage at 37 yeah. years old, you know? Yeah. And there's nothing fresh about my face. But it took me 30 years yeah. of grinding. So the reality is, you know, you you were writing Ari Gold and you're more like Ari. Because, <laughs> yeah, no, you are. I mean, if people want to know who the real Ari is, it's more <laughs> you. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Piv and we'll be right back after we pay some bills. Hey, everybody, listen, summer's coming to an end. Leaves are about to fall. While Mother Nature does her thing to prepare for the new season, you can do yours by getting free life insurance quote with Policy Genius. To properly provide for their families, most people need 10 times the life insurance coverage than they get through their employer. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all over the place. Getting started is easy. First, head to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much life insurance coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees. Let them do everything. I'm a dummy. Please do it all for me. Thank you. Head to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right.
I'm in the, in a new business. I'm I've got these great cigars called the J Piv Robusto, and I'm going to be sending them all over the place, man. So I am all about stamps.com. Stamps.com brings the service of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS right to your computer, okay? You don't have to stand in line like a dummy at the post office while some lunatic goes postal. Look at Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. And with my promo code PIVEN, P-I-V-E-N, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Forget about all that. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in PIVEN, P-I-V-E-N. That's stamps.com, promo code PIVEN. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. Thank you, guys. Do the right thing. Please don't go postal. I think Ari, again, words are important and people should never speak like this in an office place. We get it. But Ari was a good, good guy. He was a family guy. He was loyal to the people he worked with and he took care of everybody. So I always resent those things. But Well, I think what you did absolutely brilliantly was create this character with all these dualities where you immediately think he's a pig and he's trying to fuck everyone. He's monogamous to Mrs. Ari. And what we were talking about earlier is like, I'm not a guy that grew up, you know, busting everyone's balls so that when I was amongst you guys, I was, it took me a second to catch up maybe 10 years, but um, you created this character so beautifully that, People around the world who, whether the culture be, they call it taking the piss in the UK. People, one guy paid me to go to his wedding and perform as Ari Gold so. and shit all over him and all of his friends publicly, crush them. I was like, bro, I'm not going to. I looked at the check and I was like, I'll be there early. Thank you. This is amazing. Yes. What? Up? No. But like, it was insane. Yeah. And then afterwards, after I sh- I was saying things to him literally like when's the last you know, I was saying like when's the last time your wife saw your dick you fat fuck like literally that is the die and I'm going like what you know there are there are groups of people that it's it's a sign of affection yeah. to do that and you wrote this character who is so charismatic and smart and and hardworking and loyal to the people in his crew, but who can also be very offensive. Yeah. But he does it with love and it's tough love. And it's going to be interesting because, listen, you know that so many people miss this show. Yeah. You know, and um, you're starting to see from doing the live shows, you're starting to see in yeah. real time how much people love it it's, and miss it's, it. It's going to happen. And I, I mean, like whether we do it, it's going to happen. They'll, they'll, they'll be a time where they want to do it. And that's why I say we, for everybody in the crew, we all rise together and it's important that everybody does, you know, re- remember the good things. But what I, what I want to get back to, because um, you say Sean Penn says you should write me a Christmas card. Yeah. And he bets based on your writing. And I, I appreciate that. And by the way, Matt Damon, which was one of the most amazing things, he sat down at a table for lunch when he was on the show and he did an Ari speech, like verbatim. He was like, I was like, what kind of fucking will hunting shit is this? He had wow. the whole thing memorized. But what my wow. point was. I had no idea. I did a show after <clears throat> Entourage called 40. And there was a character in it who, in my opinion, was as well written, if not better than Ari. And I couldn't cast it. And I remember you asked me, you said, who does what you do? (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't quite that. That's what you said? That was word for word what you said. Okay, but Word for word. But I want to make sure we understand context. I'm pretty smart (laughs) that you're not a a, a Xerox copy that gets made. But there are people, like when everybody's, who else could play Ari on the planet Earth? And I honestly thought about it. in that history of movies, who would be better than Jeremy Piven, which I believe no one. I've said it a thousand times, but Jeremy Piven doesn't exist. Is there anyone? Is there Vince Vaughn, Robert Downey Jr.? So when I was doing this new show, I called you up and I said, Jeremy, I, like, 
who is a 35-year-old New York type of guy that's got that type of comedic chops. And again, I, I mean this sincerely, and I appreciate it so much more now. I didn't think about your process. I should have. I just thought you're just this fucking good that I give you the words and you're going to fucking kill it. Like that's how I looked at it. And on the set, for me, who was, you know me, I was pretty fucking miserable on the set all the time because I just felt disappointed, not by you, but by a lot of stuff going on, which is my own, it's your own head. You, you, you have a visual and when you're not a painter, when you're not a piano player, you can't make it happen. You need everybody to deliver, which they always did, but I'm such a, mm -hmm. you know, I see something and then when it doesn't happen, which is why writing is so difficult for me. I'll, I'll see it in my head. I'll be in the shower. I'm like, I got this scene. And then I'll stop, start typing and I go, fuck, this sucks. What happened? What was, what was from there to there? Um, and now when I get to look back at it as a fan, just almost like I'm not involved where we're doing this podcast and I watch the episodes, I think everybody was so good. But the same thing I say from minute one, that scene in Koi, and, and yes, you say over the top, I don't look at you as over the top at all. And I used to talk to Connolly about your acting a lot because Connolly, and I do, I think you'll agree with me, Connolly's one of the funniest people alive. Like, and I would say to him, you got to react because comedy is reacting. And I just, I'm not insulting you. I want you to just look at what Jeremy does in a scene where he's not talking. And Connolly really started getting incredibly good with reactions. And that's, you know, what I grew up on watching Alan Arkin and Woody Allen and, and some of the great guys, that's what you would do in a scene where you're not even talking. I mean, I remember these scenes with Will Sasso and, and Rex, you know, at, um, fuck, I forgot the name of the restaurant, Jesus, um, in Beverly Hills. But, but, but yeah. that's, an, that's an interesting example where Will Sasso, we, we were so lucky. Every, every cameo, these people overachieved. And Will Sasso is one of the, talk about funniest people on the planet. Yeah. And my only job in that scene, to be honest with you, was to not ruin the scene. Right. Because and I was literally just clenching every orifice in my body just to, because this motherfucker was going in on Rex and trying to, <laughs> his character's trying to fuck him and force feed him pounds of lobster. Yeah. And he just kept coming at Same Rex. Dibs. <laughs> I mean, it was just it was just the funniest, craziest thing. So I was just trying to hold on for dear life. We were doing a scene with the great Gary Cole, you know, who it was such a brilliant character, you know, and he's a, a tragically flawed agent that's screwing it up. And um, I was so excited about the episode. And I said to you, how's the episode looking? And yeah, you were miserable. <laughs> and, and I don't know. I think you're very comfortable in your in your misery. I'm not I, honestly because you're miserable a lot. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm when I'm making something, it's not a fun process for me. And Entourage, which should have been, you know, like a joy for eight years, it's just I want it to be perfect, whatever that means. And people right. can hate it, and people can love it, whatever it is. I tried yeah. my best, and yeah. I was so obsessive with that, and that's why I wasn't, you know. I wasn't excited to go run another show after this because I was like, I think I will die if I do it again. And I really didn't think about that with you. I just thought, I can, Jeremy can just show up and waltz in here, memorize some shit, and he's got this character down to a science, but. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Piv, and we'll be right back after we pay some bills. You've got back-to-back -back meetings, errands to run, chores to take care of, What's the secret to clearing your to-do list? A little help from DoorDash. You get dinner, household essentials, and everything on your grocery list delivered. You know what's interesting is, and I'm not making this up right now, I switched over to DoorDash. And I, I won't name you know the other company's Postmates. Um, and the, the cool thing about DoorDash is like, I don't know what is happening, but they move at the speed of light. So I'm in, I'm totally in, so this is easy. For a limited time only, you guys, our listeners get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code P-I-V-E-N. That's 25% off. That's a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code P-I-V-E-N Piven. Don't forget, that's code Piven. P-I-V-E-N for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, 
Terms apply. Look, you guys, I found this incredible website you have to check out. Nuts.com is the best kept secret for savvy snackers across the country. I mean, look, I'm not just saying this. I was just on a plane and I don't eat airplane food. And I was like, do you guys just have some nuts? And I love nuts. And that's, don't take that out of context, by the way. Um, I do. I love almonds, all of it. I mean, just count me in. Um, I mean, here's the cool thing about them. It's it's almost like they curate all these different nuts and they send it to you. You don't have to go to the store and hunt it down. They have raw, organic, roasted, salted, candied nuts, chocolate dipped, pantry items, baking mixes, pastas, all this different kinds of stuff, man. Gluten-free, which is important. I usually ask for extra gluten because I like to be a, just a big bloated mess. No, don't be. Go gluten-free, everybody. Vegan options. They make it all happen. Stuff you couldn't even dream of. They ship it to you. It's easy. It's simple. Just get up on the nuts. Newnuts.com customers get free shipping on your first order when you text LIVIN to 64000. So, so text LIVIN to 64000 to get free shipping. Free kids. I'm Jewish. I can appreciate this. On your first order from nuts.com, that's LIVIN to 64000. Terms apply. Available at nuts.com slash terms. For, for instance, I, I, when we were working with, with Gary Cole and um, why, why all of a sudden can I think of one of the greatest writers' names of all time who was Aaron Sorkin. Oh, my God. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing a scene with Aaron Sorkin where we're trying to land him as a client. And, um, and we're in prison with, with him. <laughs> and it's just the greatest, yeah. you know, high stakes you know it's just it's just amazing and i love the episode so much and that particular scene i was like you know we're gary cohen are we're, we're trying to sign aaron sorkin how did that look it was incredible and you're like that doesn't work it doesn't work it doesn't work <laughs> i was like what do you mean he's like it, 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 and, he, and, he, and you go you stole the scene i go i i didn't what are you talking about <laughs> and you go, yeah you stole the scene and, and you go you didn't have any lines and you go i don't know how, how did you is that acting what is that i don't know what that is and i'm like what do you think it is? <laughs> like it's a, it's not. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, mean that I, might have something to do with it. Like, um, so I guess my point is, like, and 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 by the way, if if people just realized, if someone were to film you listening to me right now, and they were to take you, no, now you suck. You just tried too hard. Before, I tried to act. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, what am I no, doing? I was, no, literally, they were just take you listening. Yeah. You were just your focus is on the other person. Yeah. That's the way life is. You're totally present and you're focused on the right. other guy. I'm getting so fucking pretentious right now. But one of the many no, games that we did that my man. mother did, I'm going to have her on this podcast. My mother, Joyce Piven, who taught me how to act is, you we know, put all her these, in the show. Uh, yeah, indeed. She, um, one of the backgrounds is theater games that came from Viola Spolin and that, uh, and then that, you know, ultimately became second city and sketch comedy, blah, blah, blah. But you're totally present and you're really your focus is on the other person because that's the way life is yeah. you're listening just be present and listen yeah. and react and by the way you can do all the homework in the world and john cassavetti's talked about this you can fucking do all the homework in the world if you forget that you're fucked yeah. you know you're it's fucked it's funny i mean when just, I, I did a movie david trimmer you know is, is a good friend of mine and i remember he was working with an actor and again i've never been I've never been trained to work with actors. I've never taken drama classes. So I'm just like, I'm just existing. But I remember David, I was directing the movie and David was like, can you tell this guy to fucking listen to me? Yeah. And I was like, what, what do you mean? He's, he's not listening. Uh, he's thinking about his lines and he's not listening. And even if he just right. listens to me, right? He'll even if he responds with a different line, at least it'll, you know, be on page and, and, I think it's a really interesting thing that there are a lot of actors and, and you can tell me better than I can tell you. Is it, are they not listening because they didn't study their lines enough that they don't know the material well enough? Or is that just a thing, you know? Now you're, now you're getting into a very interesting <laughs> territory and I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant as actors. Well, I know, but we are, God, this is, we are examining, you know, <laughs> the human condition and people and their interactions. And there are some people that are more present than others, you know? Um, and uh, that's just the way life is. But like, 
for me, I've had a lot of crazy things happen to me, as you know, and I realized very quickly that if I didn't intensify my meditative practice, I would be fucked. Right. Um, so I can tell you there are two different ways for a human being to be. And the, they say, you know, don't talk about meditation. It's almost like fight club. <laughs> you know what I mean? Stern but talks about it all the time. So. It, it's yeah. the best. You can either be totally present um, and, and, and in your body, or you can be a slave to all your thoughts and doubts and fears and everything else. Yeah. And they're just two different ways to be and no judgment to either one, but it sure is more fun being present. For sure. You know what I mean? I mean? You know, and, and I, the other day I, I was late and I cut someone off in traffic, not in a crazy way, but like there, this motherfucker balled up his sandwich with his, all the, <laughs> uh, with the tinfoil fucking bam, threw it into my windshield. I was like, all right, I see you brother. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you could pull up, what the fuck bro. And they come out with a fucking golf club or an AK 47 and yeah. it's a fucking wrap. Yep. The key to life is holding it together. And wow. I that's a crazy tangent. And we'll go back now <laughs> to your buddy Schwimmer, um, who he and I, I grew up in Chicago. He's a Beverly Hills guy, went to Northwestern, then started his yeah. theater company that is so looking glass, which is so prolific and brilliant. Yeah. And he and I, and I started one with Cusack called The New Criminals. And so we were both doing our thing in Chicago and and um so we come from that background and yeah. so what he was saying to you isn't some pretentious shit no I it's think just it like was. literally like you need to work so hard and own your lines and do all your homework so that on the day you can be totally present and throw it all away right but to get to the point where you can throw it all away, you got to put in some work. Right. And because if you're thinking, oh, shit, what is my next line? You're kind of fucked. Right. So these are just variables to get to the point where you're totally present and able to dance and make it look improvisational. Does that make sense? Or 100%. do I sound like a fucking idiot? No, you don't sound like an idiot at all. And I, I think I think again. So, what, yeah. so, sorry to interrupt you. Yep. So that when did that stuff land with you when you were directing him? And then did you? Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, everything that. Everything that I did from getting on a set of a, my first short film, like where I knew nothing, I was never on a film set before. When I got on my first directing job, I was never on a set before. I've always taken things and learned from them. You know, one of the things I think on Entourage, which you guys all know, is like I, I wear it on my my face. I don't hide it. Yeah. And I guess that's why I stayed away from you. <laughs> no, because you looked miserable but part and of furious. Us, and even your father would be like, I don't know why Doug is so <laughs> mad. I'm like, I don't need know, a brother. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's part of our show, which was good and bad is I, I felt like we were all kind of friends. So I do. I reveal too much. And, uh, you know, I would just give every thought that was in my head, which is like you said, there are so many things running around. I saw this like this, I saw that like that. This is getting fucked up, that is. And like you said, the most important thing right there in those moments is make sure those guys in front of the camera are fucking feeling the best they can and can be in the best place. Because even if God forbid, there's a little out of focus or the fucking design, production design isn't what you want back there. What's going to carry the day at the end of the day is those guys in front of the camera. And, and that's why I say even in that Koi scene, I remember thinking like, there's not enough extras. There's not enough this. But once that scene did start, which is when you get to, to magic and I want to be there at all times, that's where I want to be. I want to be doing a scene, especially the way I write is more play like than film like probably. I want to watch a play. I don't want to watch it cut up into fucking 400 different versions of it. And that's why yeah. people don't know this. That's why, and I want to hear about some of your inspirations, but like you n almost never did close-ups. Yeah. Almost, a, 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 and to pull that off is not easy. It, everything has to re remain alive in the frame at all times and you're bouncing off each other. And, and you know, People don't realize like every other show on television, they're just fucking cutting to a close up at all times. And, you know, that that was a big argument with HBO, too. And, and I'm not even going to say what's right or what's not. But I did. I wanted to feel that's why there were four page scenes. I wanted to feel like it was real and it was live. And I didn't want to 
have to go into the editing room and adjust how people were performing. So some of my frustrations would be when people <laughs> didn't know their fucking lines. Like it would drive me insane. I'm like, I worked for, uh, you know, the amount of time I spent on every comic, even if I was crazy about it and wrong, like just fucking get it down and then it's throw awesome. it away and do whatever you want with it after that. But um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mentioned Alan Arkin before, you know, one of my favorite uh, movies of all time is The In-Laws, Peter Falk and Alan Arkin. And, and you know, we put Tsitsi Fly into Entourage because uh, yeah. of that. But he just has this one scene, you know the scene, like I'm talking about where they're at dinner, Peter Falk, Alan Arkin, and he's talking about the Tsitsi Flies. And it's Alan Arkin's comedic expressions without even talking are so genius that it's always had this impact on me. Or Gene Wilder in... Um, Everything you always want to know about sex. I don't know if you remember that scene where he falls in love with the sheep. And there's yeah. literally like a 50 second close up of Gene Wilder's face just like turning from thinking this man who's in love with the sheep is nuts to him finding attraction and love for this fucking sheep. And yeah. those are the moments that I always went for. And that's why I say you you gave them so often in just wordless expressions. Forget how good you were with the words. But just your ability to paint something on your face that in my mind was grounded, even if it was written slightly over the top, was, you know, was the genius of it. Well, th thank you for that. But that's just what you what you're what you're being so kind to me about is literally the most basic stuff that an actor should be doing, which is to stay engaged in the scene at all times. Right. You know, and that's and they say you got to be able to play well without the ball. Right. When you when you don't have the dialogue, you know, who cares? Yeah. You're in the scene, man. I mean, like there's so much going on. So um, to get to some of those brilliant scenes that everyone loves. And I remember when we did the movie, I came to you and I go, look, man, I, I th this is the crazy thing. I don't know how you you juggled it because you had you were such good friends with so many of those guys Yeah. to the point where. I, I remember at one point I asked you, how's, this, how's the episode looking? You're like, oh, the beginning, it's just so slow. It's so slow. We got Turtle, you know, this long thing, and it's just not working. I go, oh, okay, well, is it possible? Because one of the things you would do is Ari would never bookend the episodes. You would always start with the members of the entourage, and you it would open and close with them. And I was like, well, in this particular case, maybe you start with Ari and, and Mrs. Ari, you know, where he's calling her, you know, right. a cunt muscle or something, right. you know. And um, and and you said, no, I can't. I can't do that. I go, well, but the scene is slow. And, and you go, yeah, but Jerry's my best friend. Hmm. And, and I, were, I remember thinking, you're so fucking loyal and kind to your guys. And that's really rare hmm. in Hollywood. I mean, you know, I, I mean, like when the movie happened, I mean, I added storylines that that – Warner Brothers didn't even care if they were in there. I mean, that script was 150 pages for a what was a 96-minute film. And, uh, you know, when Warner Brothers saw that script, like, we can't shoot 156 pages, I said, I, trust me, it'll be fast and it'll move. But, you know, it is, uh, uh, it is a, a fine balance when you are friends with um, people and working with them. Because, you know, but... Because it, very it, few people could have done what you what you did and yeah. be that loyal. But I like to think that I always made sure the show was as good as it could oh, be. Oh, one thousand percent. That was my plan. But and and what I used to do, what my big but my big trick. See, I have to look back at it now because my big trick was get Ari and E on the phone to get this shit rolling, like get yeah. the energy going, get the vibe moving, because that was. Like I said, your your whatever you want to call it, your meter was kind of like how I looked at the show. That's how I like to. That's how I like to live life: quick, moving, and um, again, I you know I don't know. I guess that's what I saw in Sanders. Aside from just thinking you're a great actor, I saw energy. And I, yes, you can say that, but I mean I can't even believe you saw that on Larry Sanders because to be honest with you, that show I did right out of college, and obviously Gary is a hero and an absolute genius, and so is Jeffrey Tambor. And they just couldn't decide between me and Wally Langham to play the head writer. And so they go, look, we're just going to cast both of you and split your lines up. <laughs> so like we'd be at the table wow. read it and I would just have to take wow. one line. He would take another line. And it was kind of like it was kind of perfect because here I am right out of college and I'm with with Rip Torn and all these legends. 
And of course, we're kind of treated like you just you're at the kids table. You divvy up the lines. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I didn't have a lot to do. And I was so lucky to be there. Um, and I didn't think that I, I did everything I could, but I didn't think that I was contributing much at all. I was just happy to be there. And the fact that you could even see that I was doing you know, anything. There's something Sanders had such a big influence on me. I mean, behind yeah. the scenes stuff. And Odenkirk was the first agent I ever saw. And I was like, that's kind of like, you know, like, how do we how do we top that? Wow, that's um, right. He did play an agent. So it, it's just it's all it's all it's it's an interesting thing. And I cannot for the life of me figure out why that made perfect sense to me. And I think I said it to you, too. I, I remember saying to you. I don't know if this show is going to work, but I just know I can write for you. I don't know why. And I, I can't even tell you what. I know you were in 100 things, but I can't tell you what else I saw. Was old school before Entourage? I don't even know. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, obviously it wasn't just Sanders. I saw you in whatever. And you, again, I think for people listening out there, they go, you say, oh, it was a journeyman when I didn't get the thing. Just like Dylan also, sometimes great, great actors, Odenkirk, it's like, they need them. I mean, Bob Odenkirk came on Entourage. He, my kids went to school with Bob. Yeah. I think the guy is a fucking genius. And he like either called me or we saw each other. And I'm like, he's like, I just want to come on. I'm like, I want to write something really big and good for you. He's like, whatever, just give me anything. And I have Bob Odenkirk on our show doing almost fucking nothing. That's and, how and at one point, you hate when I mention this, but at one point, Bob Odenkirk and I are looking at Mark Cuban, who has this massive monologue. And you came in and like, you know, I was just like, I was just holding it together. I'm yeah. like, you know, and you're like, he's doing great. And I'm like, listen, he's the best businessman of all time. But you've got the two of us looking yeah. at him while he's got the soliloquy. You and, know what? And, I, and I hear you. And, and I, I remember being on the set going, for, forgetting you, because obviously I always want to get as much of you as I can. But I'm like, I'm fucking wasting Bob Odenkirk right now. How do we figure it out? But I didn't solve it. But my point is, is it, that, it, but it, somehow it all worked like magic. Yeah. But my point is, is like for actors out there, Bob Odenkirk, Jeremy Piven, Kevin Dillon were just as good 10 years earlier that they were then. But when they got in the, it, it, it's not even the writing. When they got in the right spot at the right moment and the world got to see what they could do, all of a sudden it all just pops. And I think that's the thing that, no, it is, it is the writing. It is, you created a character, like for instance, even, and I told you when we were going to do the movie, I said, we need, it would be great to have a therapy scene and yeah. people really miss yeah. it. Because that's what people would say to yeah. me. And if there's a therapy scene and there wasn't initially one in the movie. Yeah. And those therapy scenes were so real and they were, you know, you say written like a play, it was it was all on the page and, we, and, and it was perfect. And that had to, because I do feel like in certain ways, you kind of are Ari. I mean, again, I'm, uh, you know, you know, I was obviously married the whole run of the show. And those were therapy scenes. You know, Mrs. Gold was Melissa. My son was your son, you yeah. know. Um, it was so real. Now, I've never, I wasn't a guy who talked like that in the work environment. And I wasn't a guy who, I'm not, a, I'm not really an extrovert. I'm a, I don't really leave my house. I was out to dinner with Mike Tyson last night. I told Michael, I don't really go out. I'm going out because, <laughs> you know, you're here. But I think things that people wouldn't say probably, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> which is fine. And I have no problem with that. But, right. um, but when you can find the person who can deliver it better, and I think as you know, we started out with a character that I didn't know what this character was. I knew he's going to be fast talking. In the first scene you're in, you're talking about cheating on your wife, which if we went that direction, you know, he's just, you know, he's just a clown. And we really got into it more and more. And and you, I remember, uh, you know. But to, to be honest know. with you, when you wrote that, I played it as if he's a guy that takes these victory laps. Right. But he's all bark and no bite. Yeah. He's monogamous. The wife wears the pants. And, you know, ask me who I'm fucking. Who am I fucking? You know what I mean? That, that whole thing. But I think it's much more interesting to have this guy that, that, plays that character but the reality is there's that duality yeah. where the wife just crushes him yeah. at home and that's really fun to What's watch so so i maybe i misread that 
Because I know you I switched know. it. I didn't I, know. I played then. it as if he was talking to I didn't know then. I really didn't know then. I had no idea. And you know, I mean, one of the things happened with, with HBO. HBO, I mean, it's like, we look back at it. Like HBO doesn't want, it doesn't want you on the poster or a specific person. And I remember going, are, are, are you watching like what I'm watching? What are you talking about? You know, there's, and I remember that the words exactly were, Jeremy Piven will never be a member of the entourage. This is an executive at HBO. Wow, I never heard that. <laughs> but it's so you don't, you know. That's amazing. There's these. I love it. I but love there's that. these gates in it. front of actors, writers, and directors, yeah. and one change of something can affect the entire. Somebody at HBO could have said, "You know what? I don't get Jeremy." And then all of a sudden, it's not there. And and really, where I wanted to go with this, you say, "Okay, that's the basic stuff of acting. The intangibles that you have, which whether they're they're learned." Uh, innate i have no fucking idea but i've seen you know 20 characters and i'm not going to name them that have absolutely ripped off ari both in the writing and both in the attempted performance and one of the in my you mind, can't say them ballers keep going <laughs> one of the most <laughs> difficult things that an actor can do and only you can tell me whether it's something you're doing or something you are is have pages that are an asshole and make that person likable. And like I say, Vince Vaughn can do it. Vince Vaughn can go, honey, here's 50, 50 bucks in case I get drunk and call you a, a bitch later or whatever it was in, uh, I forget, in, in made. You had that thing that no matter what I wrote for you, people thought you were a good guy and funny. And that's why I resent more than anything this new narrative about Ari was X, Y, and Z. I have nothing to apologize about anything that came out of Ari's mouth. Let alone, I think that every, if you took those fake characters that were on this show, every one of them to a fault would say, I love this guy. Loyal. Yeah. Could we tame his mouth down a little bit? But you were a, a performer. Ari was a performer, essentially. You know Look, what I mean? You, you depicted in your writing a world authentically and specifically and if you weren't true to that the, the why do it right okay and by the way you, you you know as as people have said oh great another show about the backstage life of hollywood we don't need it you would have been crushed if it wasn't authentic and so you had you created these fictional characters yeah. and and you created the world and guess what there are people in that world that speak like that of course okay and so you had to be true to that and if you didn't it wouldn't have been but as still, authentic but still at the same time there's again I'm, I, I know this is a world that doesn't exist where the fake people on entourage the lizzie grants the barbara millers the dana golds or dana gordons yeah um they loved you. And the real people in this town that talk like that, there's a lot of people that will tell you that worked for them. They don't like them. They were assholes. They made my life miserable and I hate their guts. And I think while, of course, when I was writing it, I saw it as a comedy. To find the actor that can deliver that is really, really hard. It's not just a good actor, which you are. It's also this I, again, I can't explain it. It's a, I think it's an intangible that you have that can put on a look on your face where you're being really almost mean to somebody, but you know this guy is trying to bring the best out of everybody and is ultimately going to deliver for everybody. So, Wow. Uh, you, you, there you have it. Um, you know, there are a lot of rumors about the reboot and, and we, got some, we got some real information and some momentum, if you will. Uh, from from the horse's mouth, from the source, right there. Uh, so we're actually the conversation continues because uh, there was too much to say. It may continue forever, but there is a part two coming up next. How you live in J Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy and Tenderfoot TV. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. Executive producer for Cast is Harley Roman. Executive producers for Tenderfoot TV are Donald Albright and Payne Lindsay. Executive producers for Common Enemy are Jared Einson and Dave Osako. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in J. Piven every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts.